Hello, let's look at the model analysis. My name is Dr. Jean-Marc Retrouvet and I'm the president of IFDE. According to Engel, the first thing you want to look at the relationship of the mesial buccal cusp of the upper first molar to the buccal groove. So we looked at that already, but something else you may, you may want to look at is the inclination or angulation of the teeth. This is something that is fairly important too. And you can make a line that respects the crown angulation. And obviously the roots should be under the crowns, as you can see right here. So that gives you an idea of the real relationships of the apices of the teeth in, instead of just the crowns at the occlusal level. We are going to be looking at one, the molar relationship. By angle standards, it could be class one, class two, or class three. Remember also that we have the super class one concept of Andrews that requires the apex of the upper first motor to be slightly distal in relation to the axis of the upper molar crown. So that's an important concept. It sits the occlusion and normally you should have no space here because the distal marginal ridge of the upper first molar should be in contact with the lower second molar. Number two is you look at, I told you, at the angulation of the teeth, which is in the mesial distal aspect. It will get you a good idea of what could be done fairly easily with some, in this case, some tipping or some torquing and how to create space. Obviously the molar distalization is much easier because you can just tipping the teeth around the center of rotation and you'll get a lot of space. Number three, you can immediately get an idea of the interdigitation and how favorable it is looking at the buccal cusp and incisal edges of the upper teeth. So it gives you an idea of how the occlusal plane is presenting itself in the lateral area. You can do the same thing on the left side, again looking at the angle class, which is in this case right here. The angle classification is very much class one in this case, but if you trace the angulation of the teeth, you can imagine that this molar is very, very angulated. This premolar is also angulated. This one is a little bit less and the canine is almost upright. You could also introduce in a case like this what we call sometimes posterior crowding, which is caused either by lack of space or loss of a primary tooth or by a mesial drift of the dentition. In the case like this one, angulation is pretty good, but you start to lose the class one here, you get in slightly here and it becomes a class two at the canine area because probably there is a slow mesial drift of the dentition, which gives you a class one at the second second molar level right here. But you will get a class two at the canine level. To continue on like on the uh, left side, you can get an idea and they're not always the same. That's why it's important to verify the cusp position in relation to the occlusal plane. Well, that will give you an idea with the line of best fit or which occlusal plane you want to use, which teeth have to move up and down. This one is not really good, but this would be the occlusal plane. And obviously it could be a little bit higher in a case like this one. Now we move on to the anterior aspect of the dentition, looking at the models from the front. And the first an important aspect of what we want to look is the midlines. So there are, as we've decided and discussed many times, this would be the reference midline. This, the, this would be probably the maxillary midline or upper midline or dental midline. And then we have the 
lower dental, and eventually the lower mandibular midline. And they all need to be coincident as much as possible at the end of treatment, but please take an extra time to register the reference midline and the lower mandibular midline in your facial analysis because it's hard to see them on models as they are freestanding objects. So the first is the midline, so let's write it up. Then you want to look at the overjet, actually overbite, sorry. Looking at, this is important, and you always try to get the overbite from the most, the line of best fit, sometimes one tooth is off, but the idea is to get the line of best fit of the four incisors, so that gives you the overbite. You also have, by the way, the overbite on the posterior area. So look at overbite here too, how much the upper dentition is overlapping the lower. You can have cross bites. So look at cross bites. We all learned that already, just a small summary. Look also at the angulation of the teeth, of the inclination this time of the premolars on bone and molars. So that will give you a good idea of what can and cannot be done or what can and should not be done. And this is the angulation of the teeth. So the inclination in the labial, and it's a labial lingual relationship or buccal lingual relationship. Four is we don't have any idea of the buccal corridors, but you want to have some idea of the width of the arch, which we'll measure when we look at the occlusal aspect, but it's still important. And look at any discrepancies, like in this case here, that you may be able to notice that something is not quite right in the relationship of the upper to the lower dentition. So make notes of that. Then we move to the occlusal. So the occlusal aspect will have to rely on the odontogram because you need to decide a very important point is this, I would call the reference point, could be here, could be here, theoretically could be here, it could be right or left. So this point here is called, the, I would call it the reference point, is extremely important because it will allow you to decide of the AP positioning of the incisors in space, which is super important for patients. They want to know where the teeth are going to be. So here, if we take the line of best fit of the incisal grooves, they are a little bit off, but it's not that really bad. We can do it on the other side too. So the line of best fit here, the occlusal groove line. So you just check which tooth is probably this guy needs this premolar. And probably this premolar needs to come in a little bit. You may want to rotate this molar a little bit. You may want to rotate this molar a little bit. This line is pretty good here, so not much to do. Then you must decide also, especially for kids, the intermolar distance. And obviously, which is a very important aspect of what we look at, is the intercanine distance, which has been studied extensively in orthodontics. Some orthodontists say you cannot change the intercanine distance. Some say you should be able to do pretty much what you want because the buccal plate can respond to slight or light orthodontic forces. But it's very important for you to understand the implications of what you're going to be doing is we have to trace a line. Let's assume that this is the correct reference line. So this is now the line that will dictate our treatment where the teeth will be positioned. You have to, and it's a decision, you have to decide according to all the other parameters you look, is the, the arch shape and where is the arch located in the, at the highest point and also at the molar area. So you basically have five points. So that's the molar that we point number two, point number three, then you have point number four and point number five. So this parabola could be, depending on the patient, could be very tapered could be rounded or it could be like really square and every patient needs to have a different arch shape but they cannot all have the same depending on their morphology 
So this is a decision you have to make at the beginning of treatment. You will be doing the same for the lower. The best thing to do for the lower, in my opinion, is to position the five points that you had decided for the upper arch. So you will use the five points and kind of have the upper arch form defined correctly. And this is totally not scientific the way I'm doing it right now, but just to show you. So first of all is you yeah, reposition the upper midline and you superimpose the upper arch form. By the way, some people like to do it in reverse. It doesn't matter. And number three is you will be tracing an arch that will be what we call coordinated in relation to the, to the upper. And now you have an idea of where the teeth that are on the lower arch have to be positioned. And four, you're going to position the teeth. on this arch form and five you're going to decide like this tooth here is obviously very far so it has to rotate this way so you're going to decide on just expansion ipr extractions it all depends all this is actually driven by a good case study using a cephalometric radiograph photo photograph sorry and also reporting all this knowledge or this information on the dental casts. You will also look at the curve of speed. And again, this will help you decide if you level the curve, are you going to be extruding molars? Are you going to be intruding incisors? Are you going to be extruding premolars? All these questions will be answered by a careful analysis of the dental cast and the information you've gathered. So look at the curve of speed. You just cannot put a straight wire in every case with a nickel titanium. If you use a straight wire in an indiscriminate fashion and you do not take into consideration any type of disclusion or anything or using elastics, what will happen is the incisors will invariably tip forward and intrude with a relative intrusion and the molars will somewhat extrude depending on the patient's musculature. So in blue is do not always flatten the curve of speed with a straight wire system that is fairly uncontrolled. So whatever you do, you have to decide which teeth have to move and how you're going to move them. So in summary, in summary, you just want to look at the class of occlusion. You would like also to design and look at the angulation of the, of the teeth to see if you can simply upright them and gain some space. You want to look at the amount of crowding, obviously, and how much space you would need to align these this teeth. You want also to know if this tooth is staying where it is, if it's going forward, if it's going distally. So all these have to be decided by the cephalometric radiograph. You also need to know if you are going to be changing midlines. And if you are going to be changing midlines, are they going left, right? If you change the midlines, make sure that you maintain a correct angulation of the teeth so you don't end up with a midline that is correct at the incisor edge but the incisors are poorly inclined which happens many times. You also want to look at the distal or posterior aspect of the dentition to see if there is some overbite on the distal aspect, if the teeth are correctly angulated. So all these have to be determine before you do anything else and obviously you need to have the correct arch shape and arch form correctly positioned in the three planes of space which is the vertical the transverse and the AP it's Y this is D this is X and this would be our origin and the, the aim is to finish with all midlines correctly positioned the overbite and the overjet also optimized.
a class one relationship, a moderate curve and no crowding and other parameters. But these are the main ones and no something that I really emphasize, no Kant of the occlusal plane. So all these studies have to be carried by a correct model analysis that will in a very organized sequence give you all the information you need at the occlusal level. Remember that the models have to be registered or used in collaboration or in conjunction with the cephalometric analysis, your own observation of the patient and the dental photo photographs. Thank you.